partly I do that because I think of things that I otherwise wouldn't. Partly I do it because I got a Fitbit last year and I'm a little <laughs> short on my steps today. So I like to kind of wander and talk. Um, I should say, I'm going to start by telling you what I'm not going to talk about. Not the typical way one opens the, the talk, but it's the way I'm going to do it today. So I actually have a new book out that's called Be Strong and of Good Courage, How Israel's Most Important Leaders Shaped Its Destiny, uh, and how those, basically, those leaders who were inspirational and put the country first were afraid to face good decisions, and that's something that Israel needs to do today, and I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, I'm not going to talk about what's going on in the region right now, at least directly. It's not to say that I may not get into it anyway, but I don't intend necessarily to talk about that. Uh, I'm not going to talk about who I expect to win the World Series, <laughs> but I'll give you a hint. They play in Houston. <laughs> <laughs> so what am I going to talk about? I'm going to talk about George H. W. Bush. Okay. Not okay. Anybody who can't hear me now? Okay. All right, so what am I going to talk about? I'm going to talk about the George H. W. Bush and his, and his administration's approach to the Middle East. Uh, here's a one-term president who nonetheless had what I consider to be a pretty remarkable legacy uh, in the Middle East. Uh, and in many ways, as Greg said, this is probably the high point of American influence in the region. Two broad areas of legacies uh, really reflect uh, the Bush presidency in the Middle East. One is that he didn't just defeat Saddam Hussein and basically save Kuwait. Kuwait was being called the 19th province uh, of Iraq by Saddam Hussein. But in the course of doing that, uh, in the aftermath be of the war, he was able to maintain what was a very broad-based coalition, uh, produce what was not only a monitoring regi regime within Iraq, but an inspection regime and one that actually dismantled the chemical weapons, the biological weapons, and the, and the nuclear program as well that was in Iraq. That was done so well that we discovered in 2003 when we went in that actually there were no weapons of mass destruction. That was very much a function of what the first Bush administration succeeded in doing, and that was uh, a reflection of the ability to put together a coalition prior to the war, the run-up to it, during the war, and in the aftermath. And I will talk more about that. But that in itself is an important legacy. Related to that was also creating the kind of infrastructure, military infrastructure in the region that made it possible for us to project power there, to sustain power there, and was a big factor in terms of what we were able to do in 2003. That was also a part of the legacy. I would say one other huge legacy, and this is actually in an area where I have devoted a lot of my career, that's to Arab-Israeli peacemaking. The legacy of George H.W. Bush was that uh, the taboo on direct talks between Arabs and Israelis was broken. Prior to the time of George H.W. Bush, the idea of Arabs and Israelis sitting down directly was still a taboo. And it's in the aftermath uh, of the first Gulf War that the Madrid Conference takes place, and that taboo is broken. So when you think about it, those are pretty significant legacies, especially for a one-term president who serves for four years. Now, it's remarkable that I say that these are significant legacies, because when he comes into office, he and Brent Scowcroft, since I'm speaking at the Scowcroft Institute, and uh, James Baker, their focus is not on the Middle East. Their focus is on East-West issues. Their focus is on Gorbachev. Uh, Larry Knapper, who's in the audience, this is, he knows very well. We work closely together during the Bush administration and especially on Soviet issues. 
Uh, and when the administration came in, the perception was Gorbachev is someone who is transforming things, but there wasn't complete certainty. And in fact, there was a debate within the administration over was he someone who was truly trying to transform the system and was this creating a fundamentally new kind of situation with a real opportunity? Uh, or was he someone who had a, a capacity to be appealing to the Europeans, uh, to, in a sense, beguile them? Uh, but he wasn't really a different kind of Soviet leader. Uh, we were to find out that, in fact, he was a different kind of Soviet leader. But President Bush coming in, President-elect Bush coming in, looked at this and said, look, our priority needs to be to focus on what we see, what the challenges are with Gorbachev. We need to test Gorbachev in terms of how real the change is. But we also have to take advantage of what are the winds of change that we see taking place in Europe. Uh, Gorbachev with Perestroika and with Glasnost, one of the things that he was doing was he allowed greater liberalization in Eastern Europe. And we could see during the transition period in the first couple of months of the Bush administration, the potential for real change in Eastern Europe was there. So it's not a surprise that that was where the main preoccupation was. I will tell you that during the transition period, when I was briefing uh, Secretary Baker, the incoming Secretary Baker, uh, he would say to me, uh, and Larry, you'll appreciate this, he would say to me, Dennis, I'm not going to fly around the Middle East like George Schultz. George Schultz, the last couple of years he was there, spent an effort to try to get something going on the peace issue between Arabs and Israelis. And Baker had been chief of staff in the first term uh, of the Reagan administration. Uh, and he was there when the Reagan plan was presented, the only plan that bears Ronald Reagan's name was an effort to present and promote peace in the Middle East in the aftermath of, of basically the war in Lebanon in the summer of 1982. And it went nowhere. And Baker was said to me, successful secretaries of state aren't successful by pursuing issues and policies that are bound to fail. So he said, I'm not flying around there. Uh, and our priority is going to be Gorbachev and East-West issues. And I said, I'm not fighting you on that, but I'm telling, I will tell you this. Uh, you may think that you can ignore the Middle East, but the Middle East will not ignore you. Every administration, and I went through and cited, each administration has faced a crisis in the Middle East that became consuming of them for a period of time. I said, Look, Johnson had the 1967 war. Nixon had the 1973 war. Uh, Carter had the fall of the Shah, the beginning of the Iran-Iraq war, the, the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, if you define that as part of the greater Middle East. I said, you won't be able to ignore this region because it will impose itself on you. And it's far better to be in a position where you can try to shape events rather than having to react to the events that you, in a sense, uh, come too late. Uh, and I basically said to him, beyond that, there actually is a potential for some, for some change. I said, look, with one of the things that Gorbachev has done is he's told the president of Syria, Hafez al-Assad, he will not support strategic parity. Assad wanted to have strategic parity with Israel. Uh, that gave him a military option. It made conflict at least uh, an option, more likely or not. Uh, and I said, that creates an interesting reality because Gorbachev isn't interested in getting sucked into Middle East conflicts, spending money on them, and he's, he's basically telling Assad, you're on your own. Well, all right, that creates some potential there. In addition to that, there was what I, ref I pointed out to him, we have an intifada, an uprising uh, of Palestinians uh, against the Israelis. And these, this first intifada, was characterized as being run by what was known as the Children of the Stones. This was not something that Yasser Arafat and the PLO were behind. This was something that was homegrown. It reflected a level of frustration. Uh, and it created a new reality. It created a new reality for the IDF, uh, which is a significant, the Israeli Defense Forces, which is a significant institute, institution within Israel. Yitzhak Rabin was the defense minister at the time. Initially, he thought the intifada would go away quickly. 
when he saw it didn't, and what he saw it was doing to the Israeli military, turning them into a police force, he began to take a view that was quite different than what he'd had before. His view was there's no military solution to the Palestinian issue. There has to be a political one. But just as he felt the need to look for some kind of political opening, so did Arafat. This happened without Arafat. He had nothing to do with it. Arafat had to prove his relevance because of it. In the fall of 1988, uh, he accepted UN, uh, UN General Assembly Resolution 181, which was the original partition plan which separated Palestine, uh, mandated Palestine into an Arab state and a Jewish state. The Palestinians had rejected this uh, when, it was, you know, when it was developed and then voted on in, in the end of 1947. Forty years later, basically, he's prepared to accept it. Why? Because he's trying to prove his relevance. Uh, in addition to that, he understands that the, the Children of the Stones have created something, but they don't know how to act on it. So he has an interest in trying to act on it. So when I went through all of this, Baker said, OK, you persuaded me, as long as it's low profile, and I'm not exposed, uh, we'll work on it. Now he also said, OK, given that, what is it we should do? And I said, well, what's the focus of the international community at this point is the idea of an international conference. And I said, in addition to the fact that the Prime Minister of Israel, a guy named Yitzhak Shamir, in addition to the fact that Shamir is someone who is dead set against an international conference because he sees Israel being isolated in it and it becoming kind of a tribunal as opposed to a negotiating forum, uh, you're going to find that an international conference has very little to do with the current reality. The current reality is being driven by those on the ground in the West Bank and in Gaza. And what we need to be doing is we need to find a way to improve the circumstances of day-to-day -day, day -day day -day reality and also point to some kind of political process that's possible. And I said the, the place to start is not only with some confidence building, on, build, confidence building measures on the ground, the place to start is with elections for the Palestinians. They can elect the people who, in fact, can then represent them. Uh, Arafat is far less likely to try to block that. He'll try to influence it, but he's far less likely to try to block that in a circumstance where he's trying to prove his relevance. Now, Baker liked this. Uh, and he said, OK, you know, even though the president and Brent and I are put our priority elsewhere, you know, the president does want to invite Middle Eastern leaders here because that's also something that almost every administration had begun their term in office by dealing with a variety of issues, but also inviting Middle East leaders to come. And Shamir, Yitzhak Shamir, was going to be the first. So Baker says to me, why don't you get word to Shamir that when he comes, he needs to come with an initiative. And if he doesn't come with an initiative, then even though you don't like the international conference, let him know that we'll go, we'll support an international conference, because we can't beat something with nothing. So sure enough, uh, I go to Shamir's, the people around Shamir, and let him know, you know, if, he's, if, if the prime minister's not coming with uh, basically an initiative of his own, and here's the one that we think could make sense, then the result's going to be we'll end up supporting an international conference. This is not a big priority for us, but this is what we'll end up doing. Shamir comes, uh, and he does come with that initiative. He comes with, a, with an initiative for an election. Uh, and basically, when he comes with the initiative for the election, we end up having a pretty decent conversation. And we sort of say, look, we need to take this and turn it into a, a political negotiating process by creating a pre-election dialogue between Israel and Palestinians from the territories. OK, that meeting goes well. Shamir agrees to it. But that's only a very small part of the story of what happens with Shamir's first visit. Because in fact, Shamir's first visit ends up being a disaster, not on this issue, but in terms of the relationship between President Bush and Shamir. Bush has, in his own mind, learned some lessons from the Reagan administration. There's a lot of things that he didn't like about the way the Reagan administration operated. First and foremost, 
all the infighting, which by the way tended to be over increasingly Middle Eastern kinds of issues, all the leaks. He made it clear the way we're going to operate is everybody can debate issues, but you operate as a team. And if you start leaking things, whoever's responsible is going to be out. It was a sociology of the Bush administration. We will work together. We'll debate things. There won't be a group thing. But uh, the minute you try to score points against others within the administration, you're out. And Baker was very clear with those of us who were working close to him. It doesn't matter who we were. If we were responsible for any of that, we were gone. Now, another legacy or lesson that he learned was that he felt the first two years of the, of the Reagan administration, there had been a series of surprises that the Israelis confronted the Reagan administration with. The Israelis bombed the Osiric reactor in Iraq, caught the administration by surprise. At one point, the Israelis bombed the PLO headquarters in Beirut, caught the administration by surprise. The Israelis went into to Lebanon in the summer of 19, June of 1982, at a time when the president, President Reagan, was at the G7 meeting, and he had a whole agenda that, in a sense, got hijacked by what the Israelis did. So Bush came, and Bush, in, the, in Bush's mind, all right, he was going to have, in the meeting with Shamir, he was going to raise his concerns. One concern was no surprises. We, can, we don't have to agree on any, everything, but no surprises. The second issue that would matter to him was Israeli settlement building, building settlements uh, in what were the occupied territories. Uh, and so they go and they have a one-on-one -on -one meeting. And, and President Bush liked to have meetings like that. He liked to deal with another leader. He liked to have a kind of face-to-face. -face. You know, in his view, if he was asking that leader to do something that might be difficult for him, he didn't want to put him on the spot in front of others. He didn't want to put him in a position where they might have to back down or look bad. Uh, he was taking into account their needs as well. Uh, so in this case, he meets alone with Shamir. He goes through and says, no surprises. And Shamir agrees. Then he says to Shamir, and settlements are a problem. And Shamir says, well, they shouldn't be a problem. And President Bush concludes, OK, he agrees with me. So he walks out of the meeting. He, he tells Baker and me, he said, look, uh, we're not going to have a problem with settlements. Uh, to which I asked, what does that mean? To which he said, he's not going to build settlements. And I said, he said that? And he said, I told him they're a problem. And he said, they should not be a problem. Now, I was convinced <laughs> that should not be a problem did not mean that they would not be a problem. And in fact, I went to the Israelis and I said, look, I'm, I think there's a misunderstanding here. I think the president interpreted what he heard from, from Shamir as meaning he's not going to build settlements. Uh, and, and the person I was talking to said, that's not what we heard from him. I said, well, you better clarify that. It doesn't do any good for people like me to clarify it. It has to come from you. He feels he had a confidential meeting where he put his trust in the prime minister. You're dealing one-on-one. -on -one, you're honest with each other. And he feels this is what he, was, that what he was told. Well, they didn't do anything to clear it up. And worse, Shamir goes back to Israel. And within a week, they announced new settlements. Now, Bush felt a betrayal. And from that point on, the relationship with Shamir was never a good one. Uh, and it's interesting, President Bush was, I would say, he wasn't just a considerate person. He was a very civil person. And the only, the only leader, one of the only leaders that he genuinely never trusted and didn't like was Shamir. When I get to the Iraq war, it's Baker who deals with Shamir. It's not Bush. Because for, for Bush, he, never, he basically never got over that issue. All right, so here we have this meeting, and it's kind of a duality. On the one hand, we think we have Shamir now ready to pursue an initiative which we think we can do something with, meaning we will create a pre-election dialogue between Israelis and Palestinians from the territories. Now, we know this isn't necessarily simple. We've got to figure out a way to produce the Palestinians from the territories. But the value of having an election uh, is that there are political issues you're going to have to confront before you can hold the election. For example, 
who runs on the Palestinian side? Uh, where, is the, where are the Israeli military forces during the campaign? Is Jerusalem part of the election or not? I mean, so we went through a whole series of issues, all of which had a serious political content, all of which by definition meant you could launch what was a political process. And Shamir had agreed with us that we would launch a political negotiating process. All right, so it's, it all sounded great, except Shamir was deeply suspicious that he would be negotiating with the PLO. The whole idea of electing these Palestinians from the territories was to say, okay, they'll have legitimacy because of the election. They'll be from the territories. They won't be the PLO. But Shamir wanted the Palestinians who might be running or the Palestinians who might get elected, in a sense, to renounce the PLO, which was an impossibility. You know, what we were seeking was the PLO to acquiesce in this. Again, trying to take advantage of the fact that Arafat had his own problems and he had to find a way to be relevant. So we were trying to use what was a dialogue with the PLO that began at the end of the, was initiated at the end of the Reagan administration. We were trying to talk with the PLO in Tunis, which is the one designated person who could speak to the PLO that grew out of the Reagan administration and we continued uh, in the Bush administration was our ambassador in Tunis. And what he was hearing from the PLO, I have to say was just as unrealistic as what we were hearing from Shamir. Shamir is basically saying, I want people to renounce the PLO, not gonna happen. Arafat is basically saying, although we're not dealing directly with Arafat, but his representative, they're saying, look, if you just accept Palestinian statehood, then we'll go along with an election. To which we were saying, if we could settle that issue right now, we wouldn't need an election. So we have two parallel tracks, both are highly uh, unrealistic at this point. Uh, and we then try to use the president of Egypt to sort of get the, the Palestinians to become, the PLO to become more realistic. With Shamir, we're trying to say, okay, look, the idea of this initiative was yours. All we're trying to do is we're trying to take your initiative and turn it into something. Time goes by, we go through the summer. Uh, what we see, again, and Baker has a distance from this. Uh, he sends me to the region at one point. He'll do phone calls, but he has a distance. He's not exposed. So he's still happy with this. It's fine from that standpoint. The president isn't pushing on this because the truth is we're focused uh, on the Soviet issue. We're focused on, as you will call Larry, uh, conventional arms reduction, because this was one of the ways to sort of test uh, the reality of what Gorbachev is really up to. So there's not, there's not any big focus or attention being given to this, but we're also not getting too far. Uh, and and I, would, I, I think it's fair to say that while Baker wasn't exposed on the issue, he also felt the need, look, if this is gonna go anywhere, I'd like to know it one way or the other. So at one point he calls up Mubarak and he says, you want us to stay involved with this? Mubarak says yes, president of Egypt says yes. And Baker says to him, well then get the, pals, get the PLO to be realistic because if they're not gonna be realistic and if I don't see anything merging here, you know, I'm not gonna be involved, Dennis isn't gonna be involved, we got much bigger fish to fry elsewhere. You know, we're dealing with big changes already. Uh, so you know, why should we commit any time if you're not, going to, you're not going to act in a way that gives us a reason to think that something can be done? So Mubarak at that point decides, okay, there's this Israeli election initiative, and he then begins to work with half of the Israeli government. There was a national unity government at the time. By the way, we may see a national unity government again in Israel. If you want to ask in the questions about what's likely to happen, I can outline what the possibilities are. A national unity government means you take the two biggest parties and they form a government together. In this case, it was Likud and the Labor Party. The Labor Party at that point was head by Shimon Peres uh, and he's working quietly behind Shamir's back with Mubarak. And they come up with a response which they say the Palestinians can accept, which is a 10 point plan. Now the problem with the 10 point plan is that the 10 point plan has items in it that are an anathema to Shamir. There's land for peace in there. There's Jerusalem. 
uh, in there. Uh, and, and there's a freeze on settlements in there. So these are all, from Shamir's standpoint, they're no-nos. Uh, but from Paris's standpoint, this is good, because he might actually force the breakup of the government. Uh, and Shamir, recognizing this is going on, suddenly becomes a little bit more forthcoming to us. So it actually gives us a little bit of leverage. Well, lo and behold, we have a, Baker decides to have a meeting with the foreign minister of, uh, of Egypt uh, and with the foreign minister of Israel. Uh, and in early September of 1989, uh, and out of this meeting, we sort of summarize some points of convergence. Uh, and you know, we think, okay, maybe we can build on these points of convergence. But Paris at this point basically has the Egyptians send a formal invitation to launch the dialogue at that point, based on the 10 points. And the vote basically is tied within the Israeli government. And the net effect of this tie is that basically the proposal is turned down. Now, Paris is about to try to break the government over it. Uh, Aaron's calls up Baker and says, look, if you take what were the points of convergence that we had in this three-way meeting and just turn them into a proposal, Paris won't break the government and we'll be able to move forward on it. So this, is, this becomes known as the Baker Five-Point Initiative, which I won't go through all the five points other than to say the essence of the points was that Israel wouldn't have to sit with any Palestinian it couldn't sit with. The Israelis would come with their own election initiative. The Palestinians would come with the, with the elections, but also the 10 points from the Egyptians. The Egyptians, the Egyptians wouldn't substitute themselves for the Palestinians, uh, but it would be understandable, it, would, it was understood that we would come up with a list uh, of Palestinians who, in the end, the Israelis could sit with. So we send this out to both sides. Everything seems to be working fine, but welcome to the Middle East. Shamir, it gets leaked, and Shamir says he doesn't accept it. Now, here you have Bush, who already doesn't trust Shamir. You have Baker, who is able to restrain his enthusiasm for working on this stuff to begin with. Uh, and now, here's Shamir, who's publicly distancing himself from this, from the proposal that his foreign minister asked us to present. By the way, his foreign minister is of his party. So, at this point, Bush calls up Shamir and he says, look, looks like you're running away from your own initiative. Oh, and just to add spice to this, right before he did the call, Shamir does an interview where he says, look, if the, I can't accept this, and if the Bush administration wants a confrontation, so be it. So Bush starts off the call in a kind of, I would say, um, you know, direct but polite fashion. Uh, and and he says, look, all we're trying to do is get you to live up to your own initiative. And Shamir says, well, I just can't sit with the PLO. And, and Bush then says, well, Jim Baker's put together this approach, which doesn't, doesn't require you to sit with the PLO. Uh, and then Bush, because he really doesn't like him, really doesn't trust him, and he says, and if you want a confrontation, so be it. So, you know, I, of course, am listening to this phone call. Uh, and Bush and Baker are basically saying, OK, we're ready for it. So I, I call up Aaron Zayd, a guy I know well that I'm working with, and I say, Bush and Baker are about to wash their hands of this whole thing. And I would say they're about to wash their hands of Shamir, too. So unless you want to avoid that from happening, you better come back to us and say you're going to accept the five points. And he says to me, let me see what I can do. I think what might be possible is we can accept the five points, but we'll have some reservations. I said, you know, as long as the reservations don't undercut the five points, we can work with that. So sure enough, he succeeds. Aaron's basically brings Shamir around, and he succeeds. Now we have to get the Palestinians. So it takes a couple of weeks, and Mubarak then produces a, a, a yes from the PLO, except in this case, the PLO has two reservations that actually are problematic. One is they'll accept the five points, but at the same time they're accepting the five points. They need to have a Jerusalemite on the Palestinian delegation, and they also need to have someone from the outside. The whole point here was to have Palestinians from the territories. So someone from the outside was to show the link to the PLO. Well, now this isn't acceptable to the Israelis. Uh, into this mix comes Yitzhak Rabin, who sees a stalemate and he wants something to happen. 
So he flies to Washington, and he raises with me a compromise. There'll be a dual addressees for a Jerusalemite, meaning someone who the Palestinians will look at as someone from Jerusalem and someone who will have an address outside of Jerusalem so the Israelis can say it's not a Jerusalemite. And he will allow someone the Israelis have deported who's on the outside to come back in. Uh, and at the same time he's there, it turns out that key aide to Mubarak, a guy named Osama al-Baz, is also there. So I tell the baker, I tell Baker, look, I got this. This looks like it can work. Uh, and he says uh, to me, OK, that sounds good. And I said, look, I want to go see Osama and present it to him and see if we can get the, basically the PLO to accept it as well. And Baker says, not so fast. I said, well, what's the problem? And he said, I want to call Shamir. I said, look, I know Rabin. Rabin is a guy who couldn't possibly, first of all, Rabin can't lie, which is true. He's one of the few people I've ever known who literally, I mean, it's, uh, his nose would have grown if he lied. He, could, he physically couldn't lie. Uh, and he told me that Shamir had approved this. Baker said, you know what? I want to call Shamir. So he calls Shamir. And Shamir says, he asked Shamir, do you know about the Rabin ideas and proposals? He goes, yes. Is it OK for us to share the Rabin proposals with the Egyptians? And he says, yes. OK, thanks. So I go share with Osama al-Baz. And, uh, and I say, look, I think we're in business if you can get a quick answer. Within three days, he comes back and says, they agree. So we're good now, right? Right? Ah, but this is the Middle East. So Baker calls Shamir and says, I got great news for you. Uh, the Egyptians are reported back. The Palestinians accept this. And Shamir says, you know, what's the rush? He says, I got a Likud party convention. It's a problem if this comes out now. Let's wait until after the Likud party convention. I write a note to Baker saying, the dog ate his homework. Uh, and so he nods and he says, OK, Mr. Prime Minister, We'll wait until after the Likud Party Convention. We wait until after the Likud, Likud Party Convention, uh, and uh, he calls Shamir back, and Shamir says, "What's the rush?" Uh, and Baker says, "Well, the rush is we're either going to do this or we're not going to do anything at all." He says, "Why? Well, I'll, I'll send Aaron's to come see you." Aaron's comes, and Aaron doesn't know any of this. Rabin hasn't shared this with him. Shamir hasn't shared it with him, but he makes the best of a bad situation. He basically agrees that he'll, he'll work on the compromise that, that Rabin had, even though he hadn't known about it. And he says he'll, he'll vote for this compromise in the cabinet. It comes to a vote. Shamir opposes it. Even though uh, Shamir loses, Shamir says he won't implement it. Paris uses that as a reason to have a vote of no confidence. It brings the Israeli government down. There are no tears shed in Washington at this point, because everybody thinks that, OK, the government has fallen. Paris will be able to put together a government. Uh, and we'll be able to work with Paris and Rabin in, in a new government. Only not so fast. Uh, it turns out there's a 96-year-old rabbi in New York who instructs one of the conservative Orthodox parties not to vote for, for Paris, and Paris can't put together a new government. We end up with Shamir being back in charge after three months of a narrow-based government without Rabin, without Paris. Uh, he sends us a message saying he's serious about peace. Uh, Baker asked me to check and say, was he prepared to accept the compromise? The answer is no. Uh, this is the context in which, by the way, Baker appears on the Hill, gets asked a question uh, about where we are in terms of this process, and he says, when the Israelis are serious, uh, and he gives them the White House information number. Now, at that point, we would have had a crisis with Israel, because the administration would have gone for an international conference would have allowed the Europeans to go ahead and launch it. But something happened. Saddam Hussein decided to go take Kuwait. And so the focus suddenly shifts. Uh, and now we're dealing entirely with the issue of Iraq and its absorption of Kuwait. Now, a little background here. The Bush administration inherited a policy on Iraq from the Reagan administration. During the Iran-Iraq War, the Reagan administration tilted towards, uh, tilted towards the Iraqis because they're fighting the Iranians. Even though the Iraqis are the ones who launched the invasion, even though during the course of the war they will use chemical weapons, 
Uh, the fact is we tilt towards them because of who the Iranians are. Uh, we take them off the terrorism list. Uh, we provide them intelligence. We give them TPQ radars, which are force multipliers for them. We end up reflagging ships so that they're able to actually uh, conduct <laughs> their oil trade. So we protect ships against Iranian attacks. We tilt very heavily towards them. We give them agricultural credits, meaning credits that they can use to buy uh, all sorts of commodities and food products from our farmers. And that's inherited by the Bush administration. We have the uh, Tariq Aziz come and visit. We have people from the White House who actually go to Baghdad. We're moving in a certain, there's a certain arc of the relationship that is, that is being moving forward. Until the spring of 1990, when suddenly Saddam comes out in a speech and says, with chemical weapons, he's going to bur burn half of Israel. That creates a bit of a pause. But the truth is, the very apex of the, of the administration and people like me who are working very closely uh, with, with Baker, and we're consumed by German unification in NATO. Baker is literally meeting the Soviet foreign minister, Shevardnadze, Every other, work, every other week around the, wor around the world. All of his NATO counterparts, he's doing the key players, he's meeting them also literally every other week. We're constantly on the road. We're preoccupied with this. President Bush, who uh, becomes known as the mad dialer because he does a lot of diplomacy over the phone. Uh, he, is, he has several summit meetings. He has a summit meeting with Gorbachev. He has uh, a number of summit meetings with European leaders. He's on the phone all the time. The whole top of the administration is consumed by getting German unification in NATO done. Not a small challenge, because this looks like it's a win for us and a defeat for the Soviet Union. So we're riveted on that. In the meantime, Saddam Hussein is becoming more bellicose in terms of what he's saying. He accuses Kuwait and the UAE of conducting economic warfare uh, against Iraq. Uh, he begins to make claims about Kuwaiti oil fields. And we're being told, although I have to say, for the most part, even though I have Middle East responsibilities, I'm not paying that much attention to this. This is being run out of the Near East Affairs Bureau, different parts of the administration, but it's not getting the attention of the President, the Secretary of State, or the, even the Secretary of Defense. Uh, all those who are dealing with it are being told by the, by the Egyptians, uh, by the Jordanians, by the Saudis, that this is just Saddam, that he won't do anything. Well, it turns out he will do something, and he goes into, into Kuwait. Now think about this. Here's the context. He takes Kuwait. We do not have any commitments to Kuwaiti security. We don't have treaty obligations. We don't have any understandings with them. We have a policy that has still been tilting towards the Iraqis. After the statement in the spring about burning half of Israel, we did put on hold the agricultural credits, meaning the second tranche. But the fact is, we still were moving in a certain direction with them. Now, President Bush makes the decision that this will not stand. Within four days, he makes an announcement, this will not stand. Now, think about the backdrop I just described. No commitment to Kuwait. Uh, a relationship that seems to be tilting towards the Iraqis. And he makes this decision. Why? Why does he make this decision? Two basic reasons. First of all, he feels we're, we've ended an era, or we're on the, on the edge of ending an era, meaning the end of the Cold War. And we're going to enter a new era. And he wants this new era to be characterized not by the law of the jungle, but by norms, by principles. He wants it understood that aggression won't be accepted. He fears if we do nothing in the face of this, this will produce, in a sense, a lawlessness, a free-for-all. Anything goes. So he's going to impose norms and limitations. That's the main reason. He started talking about uh, the international, a new international order. This is what he had in mind. He sees this as a hinge point in history. And he's going to affect that. Second reason is we've always had an interest in preventing a hostile power from gaining leverage over the oil supply. When the, when the Iraqis took Kuwait, 
They're now on the border of the Saudis, and there wasn't a whole lot there to stop them from taking Saudi oil fields. So he sees the stakes as being enormous, and he makes a decision, this will not stand. But he also makes a decision from the very beginning, this is going to be the world against Saddam Hussein. It can't be the United States against Saddam Hussein. If he's going to create a new era that's, that basically is governed by a set of norms, these norms have to reflect a kind of international consensus. Yes, we can lead that. We can mobilize it. But it has to be us working with others. So his first stop is actually to go to the UN. One of the first things that happens, aside from the fact he goes to the UN and, and, and we author and we gain support for a sanctions initiative, uh, it happens when this is, when this is going on, Baker and I, uh, I'm with Baker in Irkutsk. We have developed a kind of interesting relationship, even a rapport, with Shevardnadze. Baker has held a ministerial in Jackson Hole to create a kind of informality, and Shevardnadze reciprocates by having a ministerial in Irkutsk. Uh, and uh, while we're there, we get intelligence that Saddam Hussein is about to invade. Shevardnadze is completely dismissive. He's got close to 10,000 Soviets who are there, and he says, the guy is a thug. I'm quoting now. The guy is a complete thug, but he's not that stupid. And uh, Baker says, look, we have this intel, and it's pretty firm. And Shevardnadze says, let me check. He comes back to Baker and says, no, we don't have anything. Three hours later, he's gone into, he's gone into Kuwait. I think one of the, one of the things that one of the realities here is also shows the personal interaction of leaders who and senior officials who get to know each other. Shevardnadze felt embarrassed by this. You know, here's Baker in his country, and he knows more about what's going on in Iraq, even though we don't have anybody in Iraq, and he's got 10,000 people there. So he is, his inclination is to be responsive. Baker goes on to Mongolia in a prearranged trip. I fly back on Shevardnadze's plane. Uh, to try to work out what could be a common approach. Just so you know, this was not a function of my advanced planning. I didn't want to go with Baker to Mongolia. I wanted to go for the weekend, and so I conspired two weeks before with Shevardnadze's assistant to do, quote, policy planning talks in Moscow so I could get home for the weekend. So this was not some sort of brilliant strategic planning, nor was it altruistic. It was just my desire to get home. But it turns out it's very fortuitous. So we have a five-hour flight from Irkutsk back to Moscow. Uh, and I'm talking to Shevardnadze and, and uh, his assistant, Tarasenko, Sergei Tarasenko. I said, look, we've been talking about how we can be partners now. This is, uh, you know, we're ending an era. Now, how can we be partners if we're not in the same place when there's naked aggression like this? Uh, and he agrees. And I end up suggesting, why don't we do a joint statement? Uh, that puts us on the record of both condemning what's happened and imposing an arms embargo. Now, imposing an arms embargo was <laughs> easy for us because we weren't pri providing any arms. Proposing an arms embargo for them was a real statement. And Shevardnadze agrees. I call up Brent Scowcroft and I say, look, they're ready to, I read him a statement that I've drafted that they've accepted. And he says, now I know it's the end of the Cold War. That was the high point at that point because Shevardnadze had agreed to it, but then he got enormous pushback from the military, uh, from the, uh, the security services there. Um, I had told Baker about this. Baker says, great, I'll fly back to Moscow, but make sure the statement is good enough for me to come back. Uh, and I go through a 24-hour period where I can't reach him because he has a plane problem, and I'm threatening when they, when they change the language so it really doesn't meet the standard it needs to meet. Uh, and I'm threatening Baker won't come, but of course I can't even reach Baker to have him at least reinforce the threat. In the end, it works out because Shevardnadze delivers. Now, the whole idea, why did we want to start with the Soviets? For the same reason that Bush wanted to start at the UN. If we had the Soviets with us, it meant there'd be no veto in the Security Council for any, any resolutions that we pushed. If we had the Soviets with us, it meant that the French, who had very significant military and economic ties to the Iraqis, couldn't be, in a sense, more pro-Iraqi than the Soviets. It meant the non-aligned movement at this time. And the non-aligned was always a euphemism for those who were aligned against us. It meant the non-aligned movement 
couldn't sit on the fence because the Soviets were in the same place we were. So having the Soviets uh, put us in a position where we could really mobilize the international community. And the administration focuses on what is a strategy. The strategy is we will impose economic punishment, but we will also create political isolation. We will build the pressure on Saddam. When the president said this will not stand, the implication of that was if diplomacy failed, we would act militarily. But if you were going to get to that point, you again, you had to create a justification for it. You had to show the legitimacy of what we're doing. You also had to have others accept our objectives. Everything that is done along the way is designed to preserve the coalition. Baker later writes about this and says, putting the coalition together was not nearly as hard as sustaining it. We had countries like Turkey and Egypt whose relationship uh, with Iraq was significantly, was not only significant from a, a political standpoint, economically it was critical to them. Uh, in the case of the, the Turks, they had an oil pipeline from there, which, from which they generated a great deal of revenue. Uh, and the Iraqis provided Egypt basically oil at cut rate prices. So we ended up doing what was called a tin cup exercise to raise the money to be able to sustain a, a coalition where that coalition is imposing sanctions that are costly to those who are imposing the sanctions, not just, uh, not just on Iraq. Over time, as we begin to evolve and move towards what will have to be military action, again, uh, the focus is on how do we bring the UN along? How will we produce a resolution? Baker ends up producing a resolution of all necessary means. Uh, and so when, uh, when in fact Saddam says no to everything, including we have a negotiation with Tariq Aziz on January 9th uh, of 1990, uh, and he's a six and a half hour discussion and basically he won't compromise on anything. Uh, he won't even take the letter from President Bush to Saddam Hussein. We end up having a war, but we have what is complete international buy-in and support for it. We have a very broad-based coalition. We have key Arab actors providing their militaries to this coalition. Yeah, we carry the brunt of the fighting, but the truth is the Egyptians send a couple of divisions, the Syrians do as well. This is a very broad-based coalition. All right, so that's how it evolves. But I want to tell one story uh, before I talk about some of the lessons of this. One month after we did the initial joint statement between Baker and Shevardnadze, we had a meeting in Helsinki. Uh, this was the two presidents. Bush and Gorbachev were going to get together. Uh, now, we came from the region, uh, and we were meeting President Bush in Helsinki. Uh, and we had, been listed, we had been meeting with the king of Saudi Arabia, with the president of Egypt, and the one thing they were saying to us was, don't do anything on the Palestinian issue now. Because what happened 10 days into the conflict, 10 days after Saddam had taken Kuwait, he saw we were successful in isolating him, including in the region itself. He was being condemned by other Arabs. So he decides 10 days into the conflict, that he will say, well, you know, the real reason he went into Kuwait was because he might consider getting out uh, if Israel withdrew from the West Bank and Gaza. Now, at the same time he's saying that, he's also referring to Kuwait as the 19th province of Iraq, which pretty much is a giveaway that this is just a sham. But the Palestinians say, hey, here's someone who's standing up for us. And Fahad of Saudi Arabia and Mubarak of Egypt both said, don't do anything on the Palestinian issue now, because if you do something on the Palestinian issue now, it'll look like you're doing it only because he forced you. We can't give him the Palestinian club to hit us over the head with. So don't do anything on that. All right, so those words are ringing in our ears. We fly to Helsinki. I actually draft the statement on the plane for what can be the joint statement of the two presidents. Uh, we don't get a chance to talk to President Bush before he goes in and sees Gorbachev. We're sitting with Shevardnadze. We show him the statement. He says, this is a really good statement. And it takes, it takes a, a step further than the initial statement because here it actually implies if the sanctions don't work that we might well use force. This is another big move for the Soviets. But this is what they're, but Shevardnadze is prepared to sign off. But he says, you know, Gorbachev will want to add one thing to the statement. Uh, and he says he'll want to put in an international conference to deal with the Palestinian issue. And we, of course, say you can't do that because you basically undercut our Arab partners in the coalition. And he says, okay, but I just, uh, you know, I'm 
that's fine. I understand that. That's good. You convinced me. Um, and so that meeting breaks up. We go in to see President Bush. Bush describes his meeting with Gorbachev. And, and he says, he goes through and he describes it, and then he says, and Gorbachev will want us to put an international conference in. Now, I, will, it's, I admit that I was significantly younger then. Uh, I also really hadn't slept. Uh, but when the president said that, and he seemed to be approving of it, it was almost like a reflex. I just sort of blurted out, you can't do that. I said it just that way, showing great diplomatic flair. I said, you can't do that. And he looks at me like, what are you talking about? I can't do it. I said, you can't do it because you'll undercut our friends in the region. You'll give Saddam Hussein a club to hit them over the head with. You'll put them on the defensive. You can't do it. Well, President Bush gets, shall I say, a little angry at me. So the first thing he says back is, well, I can do that, <laughs> which of course is a statement of fact. Uh, and, and he says, and he starts, to, he, he literally starts to get angry at me. He says, I can do that, and I will do that. And then Baker jumps in, and Baker says, Dennis is right, and you're wrong. <laughs> so I'm managing things really well at this point. So Baker says, you, you know, you, you, you can't do it. And by the way, we got a statement that's worked out with Chairman Ozzie. Don't worry about it. And President Bush says, well, I have to worry about it. I'm the one who sent those kids out there, meaning our troops. I'm the one who put them on the line. Their lives, I'm responsible for their lives. If I can work this out in a way that doesn't have us going to war and spares them, I'm going to do it. And as you might imagine, that casts a pall over our meeting. No one says anything for almost five minutes. John Sununu then says, well, maybe you can just put the reference into an international conference. And Baker says, get off of it, John. And the president says to Baker, says, look, Jimmy, if you can do it, fine. But I don't think you can do it because I think this really matters to Gorbachev. But if you can do it, go ahead. Well, we went ahead and we did it. Uh, we sat with Gorbachev and we worked out the language. We made one commitment to him. We made a commitment uh, that we would uh, make a serious diplomatic effort on the Arab-Israeli issue and the Palestinian issue once this issue was totally resolved. Uh, and so um, when we succeeded, we then were staying in the region because we were then going to do a tour around the NATO countries. Uh, the president leaves. But to tell you something about President Bush, he calls Baker that night and he says to him, first, thank you. You saved us from making a mistake. Uh, I appreciate what you did. Thank Dennis. I was wrong. You were both right. Now, that's very revealing of who President Bush was that this is the way he operated. I know I don't have a lot of time left, so I'm gonna, I want to do the following very quickly. We did launch a major effort. Uh, Baker, who wasn't going to fly around the Middle East, took eight, uh, eight trips to the Middle East in eight months, and it produced the Madrid Conference, which broke the, the taboo on direct talks between Arabs and Israelis. I want to draw lessons from the past and do something that I haven't done before and may seem like a little bit of a stretch, but I'm going to do it anyway because I'm on a roll. Let's take Bush and Bush's approach, the way I described it, and apply it to, say, the Iranians today or the Israeli-Palestinian issue today. How would Bush be going about it? How would Bush say Bush and Baker be going about it? Look at what they did in the Iraq case. The focus was, first and foremost, how do we mobilize what is a broad coalition where our objective is the objective that is seen as being the right objective, where others are attracted to it because we frame the issue and we frame the issue in a way that they can relate to, uh, number one. Number two, everything they do is designed to work with our allies first. Yes, we will work with the Soviets because they're important. Uh, in German unification and NATO, Bush invests heavily with Chancellor Kohl to ensure that on the issue of unification in NATO that we're on the same page. We frame the issue for the whole alliance. Here in Iraq, we frame the issue for everybody else. Everyone else comes to accept the objective we have, and a broad international coalition is built around it. The focus is on not only economic pressure, but political isolation. Now look at where we are with Iran today. 
The Trump administration is putting real economic pressure on them, but we're the ones isolated, not the Iranians. The Iranians just done something that crosses an unbelievable threshold. It's unprecedented. They carried out from their territory a direct attack on the most significant petroleum processing facility in Saudi Arabia, which provides for with, it was providing about 60% of the Saudi daily output. It's 5.5% of the world's output. Now, they're denying they did it, but we know the cruise missiles and the, the drones, uh, we know where they came from. Now, we don't have the rest of the world sort of embracing that. Now, this comes back to, in a sense, the approach of the administration, which has been too often to berate allies as opposed to working with them, and we pulled out of the JCPOA. Now, look, had we had a Bush-Baker administration negotiating with the Iranians, and this, I can't prove this, but I know Jim Baker is the best negotiator I've ever been around. Uh, everything I've learned about negotiations and done both as an academic and as a practitioner, I learned from him. Uh, and I will tell you that he knows how to use leverage. Uh, one of the interesting things is we got the Iranians to the table in the Obama administration because of the sanctions we put on them. But then we eased them, in my mind, probably prematurely. Uh, I don't think Baker would have done that. What I'm saying, in other words, I think we probably could have had a different deal. I can't prove that. But I do know if, this is, if Bush and Baker had come in and inherited the JCPOA, they would have understood the following. They would have understood that the British, the French, and the Germans uh, would not want us to pull out of the deal. And they would have used that as a lever to get them to say, OK, look, you want us to stay in the deal? Here's what we're going to need from you. We're going to need from you to agree to do sanctions on what the Iranians are doing in the region. We're going to need from you to be prepared to put sanctions on them for what they're doing on ballistic missiles. We're going to need from you uh, to come up with an approach on the sunset provisions because the limitations on the Iranian nuclear program uh, lapse too soon. Now, it wouldn't have been easy, but they would have used that. They would have understood the minute we pulled out of the JCPOA, we isolated ourselves, not the Iranians. Their approach would have been not soft on Iran, but it would have been governed by how do we lead others and not how do we end up isolating ourselves from the very forces that we need to basically put real leverage on the Iranians. And not only th think about what that means, by the way. I just described to you not only their approach, but I described something else. Iran basically carries out this attack from their territory on a Saudi oil facility, unprecedented, and there's been no consequence for it. You think the Iranians won't do more of this? Think again if you think they're not going to do more of this. So right now, having adopted a posture that is tough economically, uh, but not tough politically because we're the ones who are isolated, we don't have the leverage on the Iranians that we need. A Bush-Baker approach, a Bush administration approach would have if you drawn the lessons that I'm describing, would have acted that way because you see they did it. That's the way they operated. Right, what would they have done on the Israeli-Palestinian issue? When we did the diplomacy that moved us towards Madrid, what did we do? We realized after the war, we had Arab partners who fought with us against, a, against Iraq, a brother Arab. So the odds are that having joined with us in a war, we had good potential to get them to join with us on peacemaking. But we also understood that if we set our sights too high, if we establish an objective we couldn't achieve, we probably wouldn't achieve anything at all. Here we had a moment to change the landscape. So we focused not on, we're not going to settle the conflict because we're not going to be able to settle the conflict right now. But what we can do is we can end diplomacy through denial. We can end diplomacy through rejection. We can end the, the reality that Arabs won't talk to Israelis. And we did. Today, the gaps between Israelis and Palestinians are as wide as at any time that I've worked on this issue, both substantively but also psychologically. The Israeli public is convinced the Palestinians will never accept Israel as a state of the Jewish people. The Palestinians are convinced the, Palestinians, the Israelis will never accept uh, a truly independent Palestinian state. They have become convinced in their own disbelief. In a context like that, the idea that you'll launch the deal of the century and you'll solve every issue is a complete illusion. What you should be doing is 
Don't launch the deal of the century and don't walk away. Focus on how you can stabilize the reality in Gaza. Focus on ground up, not just top down. Focus on creating uh, parallel steps where each side takes a step, not before the other, maybe simultaneously, that you broker, that begin to signal that, OK, maybe there's a reason to take a second look. If Bush and Baker are around, that's the way they would approach it now. And I guess I will conclude this by saying, I wish they were back. Thank you. So uh, there are more than two ambassadors in the house right now, Ambassador Larry Knapper and Ambassador Dennis Ross. The Bush School ambassadors have been coming around with uh, index cards. If you have questions, I've got some. If you guys want to take one more swing, if people have questions. I have a, a, a plethora of really smart questions, but we're running out of time, so I'm going to go to George right off the bat after I get my cup. So, Ambassador Ross, you, you said that uh, you won one round with President Bush by telling him that he can't do, do something. <laughs> but one of the questions uh, from the crowd, I think, is, is particularly relevant to the, some of the issues that people in the State Department and, and other parts of our permanent foreign policy and defense bureaucracy are facing today. Did, did President Bush ever make any decisions that you did not agree with? And if so, how did you handle it? Um. Yes, there was. Uh, here's, a, here's a decision he made that I disagreed with, but it turned out he was right and I was not. Uh, he did not want to approve loan guarantees to the Israelis. Uh, on uh, the Israelis were going to get the Israelis were now getting, in no small part because of help from the Bush administration, uh, very large numbers of Soviet Jewry coming to Israel. To be able to absorb them, they were going to have to do a lot of building. They had a million people come in, in less than three years. So they, had to, they needed loan guarantees to reduce the cost of borrowing. Uh, and the president didn't want to do these because he felt they would misuse them and they'd build, and they'd build settlements. I said to him at the time, look, they're not stupid enough to do that because they have to absorb it. Turned out he was right and I was wrong. Uh, and it turned out he was right in another way as well because uh, at one point, I was prepared to. I was prepared to do a deal, and I actually could have done a deal with the with the Israeli ambassador, where they would have stopped all. S they would have froze settlement construction for a year, mm -hmm. in return for getting the, for the uh, loan guarantees. For the loan guarantees, uh, and it was they weren't going to get all ten. They were going to get for the same for that year. They'd get two billion. Mm -hmm. This is a five-year program of ten billion dollars, so they get two billion. I thought that made sense. But both Bush and Baker felt, look, if we do that, OK, you buy one year, but then where are you going to be after one year? And more importantly, you know, this is when uh, there was going to be a new election in Israel. And they said, if you, if you do this deal, then actually Shamir will be able to show he's managing us. Uh, and you know, we actually want to show that he has a problem with us. And they were right. Rabin mm -hmm. was elected in no small part because he had a problem with us. So this was a case where they were right and I was wrong. The way I handled it at the time was just the, uh, to answer the question. I had a view always, which was, OK, as long as I have my day in court, if I lay something out to the president or the secretary of state or both, uh, and they, don't, they disagree with me, they don't do it, at least I had my day in court. Mm -hmm. as, long as, it, as long as it wasn't a matter of principle, uh, then I could live with it because as President Bush would often remind us, he was the one who got elected. Right. Uh, I, I, think he, I think he used to say, if you were so smart, why did I get elected president? That yeah. is what he would say. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and I used to find that a compelling argument. At least <laughs> I would say that to Baker was compelling. But um, if it was a matter of principle, that's a different story. If I really felt that this was fundamentally wrong and I couldn't, and I couldn't carry it out, then I would have resigned, mm -hmm. which is, I think, that's what you should do. We had a number of questions from the crowd about current events, but I think you, you, you covered them when you talked about how President Bush and Secretary Baker might have handled the current situation. So I, I want to take the questions that are specifically about uh, the Bush administration's policy in the, in the Middle East. One of them, and, and, and this is something that uh, I'm sure you've been confronted with before and the President was confronted with, uh, the argument that during the Iraq War, 
uh, President Bush called on, uh, on Iraqis to rise up against Saddam yeah. Hussein. Yeah. And that when they did, uh, the United States did not come to their support. So uh, the question is, did, did President Bush have, regret, have regrets about that? It's, it's a really good question, and there was a debate uh, in the administration, but it was uh, a level below the President, Secretary of State, and our Security Advisor, the Secretary of Defense. At the next level down, um, there were a number of us who were concerned that what the President had said would be misread. He didn't see himself, to be fair to him, he did not see himself calling on them necessarily to rise up. He was basically saying, look, uh, and this is again is in keeping with who he was, he forged the coalition based on an agreed objective, which was the removal of Iraqi forces from Kuwait. Mm -hmm. He was not prepared to change the objective after we did that to then say, all right, we're going to go remove Saddam Hussein. He was basically saying, it's up to the people of Iraq to remove Saddam Hussein. It's not up to us. He felt it would be a betrayal of the commitments he made to then, in a sense, move the goalpost. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that he felt that what he was saying was designed to be a call for them to rise up. The problem is that there were those, especially in the South, uh, who interpreted it that way, right. uh, meaning the Shia in the South. Uh, and you know, I, I, to be, I don't think that President Bush regretted what he had said. I think he regretted the consequences of what he said, mm -hmm. meaning he regretted what happened there. He felt very strongly that it was a mistake to go to Baghdad. Uh, one of, again, one of the lessons he learned from the Reagan period was also he saw what the, when the Israelis had Beirut under siege for mm -hmm. nine weeks in the summer of 82, he felt that was a colossal mistake on the part of the Israelis. And, and I used to hear him say, uh, in the run up to Iraq, he used to say, we will not go into an Arab capital. And he, that was a lesson that he drew. So I think he felt he was right about not going to Beirut. He was right about not, not going to Baghdad. To, I'm sorry, not yeah. going to Baghdad. Right about not uh, trying to remove Saddam. Uh, and, and I think he felt also that it, it would leave a vacuum that the, that the Iranians would exploit. Yeah. So I think he felt right about all that, but I think he felt regret about what happened. There were those, there were a number of us, some of whom, by the way, um, who, you know, who were in, the, in Bush 43, right who felt guilt over this, and they felt they were going to correct this. And a lot of the reason for going to Iraq in 2003 was, in a sense, the guilt they mm -hmm. felt about what happened in 1991. Now, there, was, there were a number of us at the time said, look, we don't have to go to Baghdad, but how about stopping them from flying their helicopters? Right. Schwarzkopf had agreed in the ceasefire that they could fly their helicopters, and supposedly for humanitarian purposes, and they used their helicopter gunships just to gun people down. Right. So that we did have a debate on, but there, that was not a debate that uh, those of us who were involved in won. Although there was, there was uh, and I'll follow up briefly on this, and we'll get a couple others before we let folks go off to dinner. Uh, there was a, a differential response in the Kurdish areas than in the yes, South. there was. And that what happened there, and I'll tell you what happened. It was, uh, we were in Turkey, uh, and we were dealing with what was the flow of refugees into Turkey, and we had to... We were hearing from Ozal, who had been our partner in the war at some cost to him. Shut down, he had shut off the pipeline. That's right. Yeah. So, um, so we flew down there, and we went into northern Iraq, and we saw 50,000 Kurds on a hillside, mm -hmm. uh, living outdoors with no shelter, no protection. And it was very clear, a very large number of them were going to die. And Turkey was saying, we can't let any more in. Baker went back to the plane, and Baker got on the phone uh, directly with the president from there. Uh, and he said, we have 50,000 people here, more are coming, we have to protect them. That was where, we, where the idea of no-fly zone was born. Mm -hmm. We carried it out and it actually worked. I will say one of the things I raised during the Obama administration when there was a reluctance to do anything in Syria, right. I said, why can't, we were, we were able from 1991 to 2003 to have a no-fly zone first in the north and then in the south mm -hmm. uh, of Iraq. It didn't come at great expense. We were able to manage that. Why can't we do that on Syria as well, uh, drawing from that lesson? And the answer was we weren't going to get sucked into Syria. There was a fear that it would be, uh, it would be Iraq all over again. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think uh, President Bush's major failures or flaws were in his Middle East policy? It was, it was a success by yeah. most standards, but... 
Yeah, I, look, I, I think that, uh, I don't think there were many failures or flaws with his policy in the Middle East because I think, as I said, you look at what was done, um, you know, the main, I think, had he had another term, uh, I think we would have had a deal between Syria and Israel. Yeah. I'm almost certain of that. Yeah. Uh, number one. We came uh, very close in the Clinton administration. We did, and, and the truth is, uh, in the case of Rabin had enormous respect for, for Baker and Bush, right. uh, and Assad did as well. Uh, and I think that the that with Baker again as the as the key negotiator, I think we would have done that. The other thing is, the where there was a flaw was how we didn't think through what the real impact on sanctions was going to be within Iraq itself, mm -hmm. and how Saddam Hussein would be able to exploit it, that he would still find the loopholes in the sanctions, right. but his people would suffer, and it would be hard to sustain it because of that. I think again, had we been there, we would have had an answer to that. Uh, I mean, I was there, but right. I wasn't. I was no longer responsible for that. I was yeah. responsible only for the peace issue. Yeah. Uh, but knowing Bush and Baker, what they they were, they had a capacity to identify a problem and then deal with it. Uh, so, you know, did they fully see what w how Saddam was going to be able to exploit the sanctions? No, they didn't. But they were also then out of power. Right. There's a a good question about current events, but I want to take it back to the, the, the situation of the Bush administration. It's about Russia, the current situation with Russia, and how do you deal with Russia vis-a-vis -vis the Middle East. Yeah. Do you think that, that the successes of the Bush administration in the Middle East were more about the, the style with which uh, Secretary Baker and President Bush exercised power and sustained coalitions, or was that just such a sweet spot because the Soviet Union was on the verge of collapse and then did collapse, the United States was on was unparalleled in its, its power at the time. You know, you, you know, you get a really good hand and you can yeah. play it well or you can play it poorly. Right. So which way does it go? And vis-a-vis uh, -vis the current situation where you've got a Russia that is not going to be cooperative, you've got a rising China that kind of doesn't know what it wants to do in the Middle East, but people in the Middle East are looking at that rising China. Look, there's no question that the, the current circumstance is uh, a whole lot less hospitable to our aims and objectives right. than, than that was. But I would also again say, you know, the Bush and Baker carried off German unification in NATO at a time when nobody other than the small circle around them thought this was possible. Right. Pe people should remember that the French were against that, the, the British, British were, were against, against it. it, and the Soviets were against it. And, and the Germans, think about it. I mean, if, if Gorbachev had come and said, absolutely, I'm for unification, but you can't be in NATO. And we anticipated that. Mm -hmm. uh, no one was predicting in most of the punditry class that this was possible, and yet right. they pulled it off. So you could actually say their hand going into that wasn't so great, mm -hmm. and yet they were able to take advantage of it in terms of how they identified the points of leverage, how they dealt with Gorbachev. Uh, Larry, Larry will remember, we focused very heavily on how we could give Gorbachev an explanation, not only in terms of process of 2 plus 4 to show it wasn't being imposed on him, but also we changed NATO doctrine to mm -hmm. show this was not, you know, NATO wasn't an enemy any longer. Mm -hmm. So we, plus the way we worked with the others, they took advantage of every opening and they shaped it. They didn't just react to it. Mm -hmm. um, I do think this administration actually had a lot of advantages that it squandered. Mm -hmm. When it came in, um, as you know, Obama was seen uh, in the Middle East as, uh, as not reliable. Yes. I mean, I used to say when I, was <laughs> when I went out to the Middle East during this time, if I put a blindfold on, I didn't know who I was talking to, Arabs or Israelis, because they said the same things. Uh, well, that's pretty much where things are again today. Mm -hmm. When Trump came in, uh, he had, uh, there was a kind of relief that Obama was gone. There was a perception that Obama was so determined, you know, to have the deal with Iran work that he was prepared to sacrifice every other interest there. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and today, you know, well, I just say when they came in, you know, they, uh, there was a leverage because we had, we had the Arabs and Israelis alike prepared to be quite responsive to us. Mm -hmm. uh, and the truth is, okay, you know, the Putin also saw an opportunity with Trump to be responsive to what he was doing in Syria. Uh,
Today, I would say we have leverage. I mean, even though you can look at what's going on with China, the fact is the last thing China wants, because they get a significant part of their oil from the Middle East, the idea that oil facilities in the Middle East are fair game, right. last thing the Chinese want. Right. And that could be used, again, to, for them to exert leverage uh, on the Iranians. And the truth is one thing about Putin. Putin wants to be seen as the arbiter, and he wants Russian power to be seen as decisive. He doesn't want American power to be seen as decisive. Now, if we were in a position where it became clear that, look, if you're not prepared to join with us, you, make, you increase the odds that force will be the only option that's left to us, mm -hmm. I think you would affect Putin's behavior as well. You would certainly affect the European behavior. Mm -hmm. Please join me in thanking Ambassador Dennis Ross for a fascinating evening. Thank you.